Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be here with all of you tonight. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. We are going to have yet another one of our great late night conversations. Should be awesome as usual. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Let's go. Spoken of the American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything will be all right if everything was put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the masses. We need a government of action. Welcome, 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 everybody. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. We are going to have yet another great late night conversation. We're going to talk about all kinds of important things. Uh, so for those of you who may not be familiar with the way we do things, uh, the way that this generally works is I give my opening remarks and my opening remarks are followed by a roll call where I call you all out as I see you, names and locations, names and locations. We find out who is on the other side of the camera, who's watching. And then from there, um, I answer your questions uh, for the rest of the night, right? We got somebody who's asking me about the recent passing of a great anti-imperialist hero, Russell Bentley. Uh, it's the first one we got, right? If there's any rumble ramps, uh, you know, that's the way that's the way this works is I give opening remarks, then we do the roll call, then I answer your super chat questions or your rumble rant questions in the second half of our show. So if there is something that you would like me to respond to or engage with or answer in the second half of the show, just send me a super chat and I will do my best to give you an answer. Um yeah, uh, it's starting to feel a little bit like summer in New York. It's still a little chilly. I had to wear a light jacket when I went out. Wind was blowing. Uh, but it was a sunny day today. It's starting to feel a little bit like summertime here in New York City. However, um, as I was outside enjoying the weather, uh, we all know what the U.S. Congress was doing. But before I get to that, we do have a couple quick announcements Two quick announcements. First quick announcement uh, is that we have a new book that's available. And uh, this is the new Center for Political Innovation textbook uh, that is now available for purchase. Um, this is it. Uh, you know. Uh, hold on. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, there we go. Just wanted to get it the right size there. Out of the movement to the masses, anti-imperialist organizing in America. This is our new textbook. It is 532 pages long. Uh, it has a history of anti-imperialist groups in, in America. It's a history of anti-imperialist groups in America. It has a lot of original texts, uh, speeches by leaders like William Z. Foster and Eugene Debs and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, uh, Maoist groups in the 70s and Bill Epton and all kinds of original texts. Um, and uh, we put it together. Um, special thanks to Marissa and Elizabeth who worked very, very hard for us to finally put it out. It got very stressful towards the end with Amazon and their stipulations, and their requirements, but we did finally release it. And actually what's interesting is um, right now it costs almost nothing. Right now it costs only $16 and 74 cents. Now uh, that's for specific reasons that I don't want to get into, but next week, um, you know, uh, I guess not next. Yeah. Well, I guess, 
after our retreat in Vermont, it is going to cost way more than that. So you've got about seven days to buy it at the current price, which costs next to nothing. We make no royalties off of it. You know, it is at the bare minimum price right now. Uh, so if you want to buy it now, now would be the time to get it because we intend on raising the price uh, so that we actually get some royalties from it um, after after a week or so. But for the moment, for the time being, it costs nothing. Um, you know, um, you know, um, so based on that, um, if you want to get it while it costs nothing, uh, you can do that. Um, you know, nothing stopping you. Uh, it is available. We wanted to have it out in time for our Vermont retreat. And so we published it 532 pages in length. Um, a lot of original texts, a lot of analysis of divisions in the ruling class. I've got a section about Lyndon LaRouche, Lynn Marcus. I've got a section about, about Sam Marcy and, and the Workers' World Party and all kinds of original texts and histories and timelines. And this is a full academic textbook of anti-imperialist organizing in America. Um, not available in Australia yet. That's interesting. Let me check that um, because it should be available in Australia. Should be available in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Here it is on. Uh, here it is on. Um, you know, Amazon Australia. So I'll, I'll show you the link. Yeah, it's available in Australia. Here it is on on Amazon.au. Here's the Australian link. So if you're in Australia, it is available. Um, you know, uh, but yeah, that's that's the book. Um, we worked very, very hard on it. We're very, very proud of it. Um, and uh, yeah, here it is. So wanted to just let you know that that's out there. Now, the next thing I also wanted to remind you uh, is that we are having our retreat, our gathering in Vermont is taking place out of the movement to the masses, a city builder national educational workshop. Uh, it's going to be a four day educational gathering in Vermont to learn anti-imperialism, to learn socialism, to learn about what we plan to do and the thinking behind the Center for Political Innovation. So if you would like to come to the retreat, there is still space open. Uh, it's four days, plenty of good food, nice packet of swag and pen, CPI pens and CPI t-shirts and everyone who comes is going to get some nice swag and it's going to be a lot of fun. So if you can make it, um, by all means, register. There is still space at the retreat. We'd love to have you join us. Um, so yeah, and uh, there you go. Uh, I just wanted to mention that as well. So those are the announcements. Um, and I will now be moving toward the opening remarks for tonight. Uh, keep in mind, as I said before, uh, you know, I'll be answering people's questions in the second half of the show. Uh, I see that there are, you know, two super chats that have come in. Uh, Noah has a question. Um, so that's great. Um, you know, and uh, if you have any more questions, by all means, send them my way. I'm happy to engage with all of you. Not much happening in the Rumble chat lately. I've noticed we have plenty of chat on YouTube. But the Rumble, there's a lot of people watching, but nothing happening in the Rumble chat. So Rumble people, start talking amongst yourselves, start making quirky comments, etc. Anyway, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. I'll be answering people's questions in the second half of the show. Um, so I guess we're just going to talk about what just happened uh, today, which is that $95 billion of American taxpayer money was spent um, $61 billion for Ukraine, $8 billion for Taiwan, and $21 billion for Israel. And it is absolutely a disgrace. Absolutely a disgrace. Absolutely a disgrace. And the reason that it is absolutely a disgrace is because right now, America is falling to pieces. 
right now, our population doesn't have what it needs to get by. And $61 billion for Ukraine, $8 billion for Taiwan, $21 billion for Israel. And all of this money uh, is being spent to foment division. Right? In, Israel is currently bombing and killing the Palestinians. This is going to enable them to do it. Ukraine is waging a relentless war that they have no chance of winning against Russia and throwing the lives of their population away and prolonging a conflict that should have been over a long time ago. Taiwan is part of China. It's called the Republic of China. Um, the U.S. government recognizes one China. The people on Taiwan and the people of China generally get along with each other. Um, this is $95 billion. $95 billion to make the world worse. I, I mean, there's just no way around it. Uh, it's $91 billion to make the world worse. I mean, $95 billion to make the world worse. And I mean, the world is not going to get better because of this. The worst thing about it, and I must say this, the worst thing about it is that, um, so a lot of Republicans voted against it, and the majority of Republicans voted against it, but a few voted for it. Mike Johnson did a backroom deal, the very thing he promised not to do when he was made the Secretary of State or the, I'm sorry, the, the Speaker of the House, right? Um, you know, uh, and it was the very, very thing that he promised not to do uh he did he made the deal just like kevin mccarthy made his deal previously um so there we go and there were a very small number of democrats in the house who voted against funding for israel now what they did is they separated the spending bill they made a separate bill for ukraine they made a separate bill for Taiwan and a separate bill for Israel. All the Democrats universally voted for funding Ukraine. Many Republicans voted against it. All the Republicans universally voted for funding Israel. But a couple Democrats voted against it, and they all voted for funding Taiwan. And what's interesting is that, that there is clearly an attempt to divide anti-imperialist sentiments. And the message here is that Arab Americans should vote for the Democrats because some of them are kind of maybe against funding Israel. And the message is that Americans that are increasingly critical of the deep state and questioning government policies, et cetera, should vote for Republicans because some of them are kind of sort of against funding Ukraine. But at the end of the day, it all passed anyway. And one thing that I'm really urging people to not do, don't fall for the attempt to divide the anti-imperialist movement. So, I mean, and that seems to be what they're trying to do right now. The idea is if you're pro-Palestine, you should hate Russia. Because, look, all the Republicans that are, that are critical of funding Ukraine, they all voted for funding Israel. And if you're pro Russia, if you're against hostility to Russia, you should absolutely hate Muslims and Palestinians because all the Democrats uh, who were critical of Israel, they also all voted for it. And this is obscuring reality because the reality is that the biggest friends of the Palestinians are the Houthis and the Iranians and Hezbollah. And they are aligned with Russia. So the fight in Donbass and the fight in Gaza are the same. Right? The biggest backers of Israel 
are all the Western capitalist imperialist countries. Just like they are the biggest backers of Ukraine. Just like they hate the People's Republic of China. It's one imperialist system, and it has many faces. However, the crowd that is woke tends to be a little bit more sympathetic with Palestinian protests. The crowd that is anti-woke tends to be a bit more sympathetic to not funding Ukraine, not pushing hysteria about Russia. But at the end of the day, we're fighting the same system. It is imperialism, capitalism in its monopoly stage. It's the same countries on either side. And whether you're enthusiastic about what the imperialists are doing in one part of the world and not enthusiastic about what they're doing in the other part of the world, it doesn't change the reality that we're fighting against one imperialist system. And the people fighting imperialism around the world know that. The Palestinians, they know who their allies are. The Houthis are not stopping Russian and Chinese ships. They've made that clear because they know what side they're on. The Iranians know who their friends are. The Russians know who their friends are. Russia's never been more anti-Israel than it is right now. I'll just tell you that much, right? Russia still recognizes Israel, still has diplomatic relations. They are calling them out like crazy at the United Nations. Uh, it is, it is, they are really sticking it to Israel, uh, and rightly so. Uh, because Israel is bombing Gaza. Israel attacked Iran with a completely illegal, illegitimate attack uh, and provoked Iran to have to respond. I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? China and Russia are closer than ever. Like, like this attempt to divide the anti-imperialist movement, uh, it needs to be opposed. And, you know, one of the main groups that is trying to separate the Palestinian struggle from other struggles is the Party for Socialism and Liberation, right? They're running the Palestine protests around the country, and they have worked really, really hard uh, to play up the idea that somehow the struggle of the Palestinians is separate from the struggle of the people of Donbass. You know, Brian Becker and PSL are neutral in Ukraine. Abby Martin, who you know, is one of the PSL aligned voices has gone as far as supporting the Russian peace movement, meaning the people that are funded by the United States to try and destabilize Russia. Right. Um, meanwhile, they're stage managing the Palestinian rallies and they go out of their way to make the Palestinian rallies hostile to the American people, having them block traffic, having them burn American flags at the same time they wave Palestinian flags, having them say that America is just like Israel, it's a racist, evil, evil settler country, trying to make sure the Palestinian movement views average Americans as the enemy. Meanwhile, a large chunk of the voices that are dominating the conservative anti-woke current somehow fit not wanting confrontation with Russia, with supporting Israel. And they, they push the idea that Muslims are the enemy. Well, Russia has more Muslims in it than any other non-Muslim country. And Russian President Vladimir Putin is wildly popular with Muslims. And Iran and Russia are closer than ever. So that's just malarkey. But a lot of the conservative voices that you listen to try to play up the idea that somehow uh, that, you know, that if you, um, you know, uh, if you are opposed to what Israel, you know, is doing, that means you hate Russia, right? And they're trying to divide the anti-imperialist movement. That said, I think the right um, at this point represents the lower levels of capital and the right, the right is kind of more effectively tapping into mass sentiments. The, the left is building a, a fanatical woke counter gang, uh, a group of people that are very loud and, and are very good at intimidating people. The right is playing into photo po faux populism, and they represent, to some degree or other, lower-level capitalists who don't accept the degrowth agenda of the ultra-rich. Uh, but at the same time, they both seem to be bolstering a pro-imperialist message. We are against imperialism. We are against the global capitalist system, the global imperialist capitalist monopolistic system that is grinding the world into poverty. We want a government of action that will fight for working families. That is what we want. And so at the end of the day, we're against funding 
Ukraine. We're against funding Pal uh, Israel. We're against funding the government on Taiwan. We are for funding American jobs, American schools, American health care. We are for building an economy here in the United States that serves working families and not the wealthy few. That's what we are for. And uh, so that said, I am going to show I did. I, I'm liking Marjorie Taylor Greene more and more and more because as Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, she's bad on Israel. She's I'm not endorsing her politics, but I'm saying that the way she has thrown down against Ukraine funding is very inspiring and that she's throwing in facts about the U.S. economy as she does it. Her speeches are suddenly focusing on the military industrial complex, on how war is to maintain uh, an economic setup for this country that's deeply unhealthy. This was Marjorie Taylor Greene's speech before Congress today. And we're going to react to it because, you know, there's a lot in here we can disagree with, stuff she says about the border, et cetera. But there's a lot in here that we can really agree with. Um, and you should listen to it because it shows how contradictory the MAGA movement is at this point. On the one hand, the MAGA movement is pushing anti-immigrant bigotry, and it's pushing the idea that privatizations and austerity and cutting spending is the answer. It's one side of MAGA. On the other side, MAGA is pushing that we need to restructure the U.S. economy to serve the American people. It's pushing the idea that the military industrial complex is the enemy of the American people. It's pushing the idea that we need to re we need we need, you know, we need to reindustrialize the country and, and we need to populate the country more. And there's it's MAGA is becoming more and more of a dual movement. There are two souls to MAGA. One is a, a, a kind of right wing anti-communist, authoritarian, you know, cops and the military edge. The other is a very working class, economic populist and anti-war edge. There are two souls in MAGA. Um, and I, I think we need to find a way to separate those two souls as effectively as we can. Um, you know, uh, you could argue that maybe that's the case for the left, right? On the left, you have the Bernie Sanders folks that do emphasize economic justice. And then you have the woke folks that just emphasize tear it down. Everyone's a racist, sexist. I don't know. And, you know, maybe we need to isolate the, the Bernie Sanders populist sentiments of the left and the, and the MAGA anti-war populist industrialization pro-growth side of, of the MAGA and separate them on the MAGA side from the anti-immigrant, free market, et cetera, side, and from the, you know, and separate the, you know, the the Bernie economic populist wing from the the woke stuff on their side. Maybe we need to need to polarize both sides of the political spectrum. Because I feel like there are some people in left-wing circles who believe in genuine socialism still. They get canceled, they get smeared, they get threatened, but they, they exist. Um, you know, and there are people uh, in the MAGA side, um, you know, who aren't excited about anti-immigrant bigotry, uh, aren't excited about the police state that would be necessary in order for the immigration crackdown to come. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and genuinely do want to see a prosperous United States even if that means trading with Russia and China. So let's listen to Marjorie Taylor Greene's speech and let's comment on it as we go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My amendment today would drive uh, the amendment, uh, the bill for Ukraine, take each dollar amount in this act is hereby reduced to zero. You see, the United States taxpayer has already sent $113 billion to Ukraine. And a lot of that money is unaccounted for. This is a continuance of a sick business model that the American government continues. The federal government continues to fund the military industrial complex. And this, this is a business model that requires Congress to continue to vote for money, to continue to fund foreign wars. And this is a business model the American people do not support. They don't support a business model built on blood and murder and war in foreign countries, while this very government does nothing to secure our border. I mean, she's what's what's important about what Marjorie Taylor Greene is saying there is she's not just condemning a policy. She is condemning the economic model 
of the United States. She is condemning the military industrial complex. She's condemning how American economic hegemony around the world depends on destroying other countries. She's saying something quite radical there. And that's a shift in Marjorie Taylor Greene's rhetoric. She is challenging the way the U.S. economy is set up. She's challenging what Lenin called imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, the monopolistic drive of you know huge multinational corporations that have to carve out spheres of influence of territory around the world and beat down their competitors. I mean, she, she's pointing toward an economic reality. She's not just saying this is a bad policy, right? She's pointing toward an economic reality. And that's very, very, very important. American people are over $34 trillion in debt, and the debt is rising by over $40 billion every single night while we all sleep. But yet nothing is done to secure our border or reduce our debt. Inflation has driven out of control. Americans are suffering every single day. They can hardly afford their grocery bills. They can hardly afford gas in their car. They can hardly afford rent. And now mortgage payments are well over $3,000, where they were only just over $1,700 three years ago. The youngest generation, young adults, don't even think they're going to be able to buy a home in their lifetime. And today in Congress, the most important thing that this body thinks should be done is to send another $61 billion to a war in Ukraine that the American people by 70% do not support. Everything she said there is correct, right? That our economy is devastated. Uh, our living standards are going down. Household debt is through the roof. Young Americans are not ever going to be able to own their own homes. Uh, all of these awful things are happening. And our political leaders are far more concerned about financing a war the American people are against in Ukraine, financing a, a foreign war than they are about the American people. She's absolutely right. Mind you, this comes on the very heels of Monday being April 15th, tax day, where every single American had to scrounge up their money and send their dollars in to the IRS. Or some of them had to file extensions because they weren't ready and didn't have the money to pay their taxes. But today, this body says the most important thing we can do, no, is not reduce spending. That's not it. Not How would reducing you know, when she says reduce spending, that means cuts in social services. How would that help? Right. I mean, it's bad enough, the living conditions. Now get rid of all the government jobs, get rid of government subsidies for education, get rid of pay for teachers and postal. I mean, it's like, see, this is where, again, we don't agree with all of this. We don't agree with what she said about the border. We don't think immigrants are the problem. We don't think a crackdown on immigrants is going to so solve the prep situation there. And we also, I mean, when she's saying cut spending, I mean, why would that do any good? Right. We want to cut spending on foreign wars. We don't want to cut spending on America. We want jobs for teachers. We want jobs for postal workers. We want jobs for government employees. We want food stamps for low income families so that food can be subsidized. I mean, I mean, we are you know, we shouldn't be opposed to government spending. We're not libertarians. Right. And that that, you know, we're, I mean, you know, the libertarian argument, they're against foreign wars, but they're also against, you know, uh, you know, any government spending on anything, the magic market will just solve all the problems. Uh, that is that is just wrong. So again, you can see MAGA has dual character here. We're not fully embracing everything she says, but she is taking this this non-interventionist stance to another level, which I appreciate. Not to do anything to drive down inflation. Oh no, we can't do that for the American people. It's not to secure our own border that is invaded every single day, every single day by people from over 160 different countries. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, uh, to stop the crisis of mass migration, we need economic development against the around the world. The Belt and Road Initiative, you know, is a great step toward stopping mass migration, right? I mean, we've said many times at the Center for Political Innovation that the answer to the border crisis is the Zan Sandino Zapata Economic Corridor, a corridor of development between the southern United States all the way down to uh, Mexico or all the way down to Nicaragua uh, and, and raise people out of poverty, bring Chinese companies in there to invest, uh, hire American workers to go down there and build infrastructure so people are not you know, they have something other than drug gangs and, uh, and 
drug cartels and, and poverty, but they have economic opportunity that would stop the flow of migration. Um, you know, and building a giant wall isn't going to solve the problem. Uh, it would just lead to more of a police state. So that, that's, that's an important thing. We're not, we're not where she's at on the border, but again, listen to what she's saying here. There are some important things that she's saying. No, don't secure the American border. Let everyone in. We have over 1.8 million known gotaways. We don't know who these people are. And yet you have members of this body talking big and tough about, oh, we have to defeat Russia. Oh, we have to protect Ukraine. But yet all of you are unwilling to protect the American citizens that pay your paycheck, pay the, pay the light bills in this building, and pay for this entire federal government. For what? For nothing. Ukraine is not even a member of NATO. Ukraine is not a member of NATO, but the most important thing you hear in Washington, D.C. is, oh, we have to spend Americans' hard-earned tax dollars over to Ukraine and keep the money going to continue to murder Ukrainians, wipe out an entire generation of Ukrainian men so that there are widows, there are fatherless orphans, there are not enough men to work in their industries. Oh, but you really support Ukraine. Wow, what kind of support is that? This is great. This is tremendous. She's absolutely right. She is absolutely right. And thank goodness she's saying this on the floor of Congress. I mean, this is amazing, right? This is great. This is tremendous. I'm really, really glad that she's saying what she's saying. Uh, this is this is great. I mean, she's I mean, they don't support Ukraine by pushing Ukraine into a war, by prolonging that war by using Ukrainians as cannon fodder to try and weaken Russia. They don't care about Ukraine. She's right. She is absolutely right. She's absolutely right about what she's saying, and I appreciate it. It's repulsive. You know, shame on the American government. Shame on the American government. If we support our military, support our military. We should be funding to build up our weapons and ammunition, not to send it over to foreign countries to kill foreign peoples. And if this body was worth what it claims... Again, not sure I would put it that way. I think our military already has a huge budget. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like our military is for lack of funding. That's kind of an odd way of putting it. But again, you know, we're not fully endorsing everything she says here, but we're celebrating the very powerful things she did say. ...to be what it is. Every single one of us would be demanding peace in Ukraine between these countries, peace for these people so that no more of them have to die. But you never hear anybody demanding peace. No, 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 no. Peace is the last thing Washington wants because it doesn't fit the business model. Yep. Boom. Again, boom. If you cared about the Ukrainians, you'd want a negotiation. You'd want an end to the conflict. Um... Again, boom, very, very important. I'm really glad she's saying these things. I mean, so good that she is saying these things. This is a business model that they say continues our economy, protects American jobs. What a disgusting business model. <laughs> she's right. She's right. Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, capitalism in its monopolistic stage, where big corporations, trusts, cartels, and syndicates dominate the global economy and hold back economic development, the export of capital, using wars to dominate the economy and seize territory as, as you know, captive markets and beat down their competitors and using war as a driver for their profits. I mean, this is a disgusting economic model. She is absolutely correct. We should have a business model that builds up our American companies and American jobs to serve American interest. And yep, yep. And our military and our government should care about protecting the national security of the United States of America and the Americans that pay their hard-earned tax dollars to fund all of this. America last. America last. That's all this is. Every single day, America last. General, gentlewoman's time has expired. I yelled. Yeah. A lot of really good stuff in that speech. A lot of very, very good things were said in that speech. And if you if you want to deny that. Right. And I really don't get it. Right. You know, because it's like so many progressive people, you know, Bernie Sanders does something good and they'll highlight it. 
and you know, Bernie Sanders is a Zionist, is a supporter of Israel. Uh, Bernie Sanders supports prolonging the confrontation with Ukraine, but he'll say something good. They'll highlight it and no one ever attacks them for doing that. But I highlight something good that Marjorie Taylor Greene says amid the bad and people attack me. Oh my God, you're defending a right winger, blah, 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 blah. I don't have any loyalty to the left, right? And neither should you, right? You know, and Peter Coffin has done a lot of great stuff on this. He's writing a, a or he's working on a very good full length documentary on this topic we should have no loyalty to the left by any means. I mean, there's, you know, we should be loyal to anti-imperialism. We should be loyal to working families, socialism, opposing the low wage police state. Like that's what we should be loyal to. This idea that, that we should have, we should, we should, you know, we should clutch pearls as they say, <gasps> you know, clutch pearls over anything right wing. I mean, you know, I mean, my God, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous. And anybody who's been to actual socialist countries know that knows they have nothing in common, absolutely nothing in common with wokeism, absolutely nothing in common with wokeism. Right? Wokeism is about depression and hopelessness and misery, and socialist countries are all about strength and community and organizing, etc. So. We're not loyal to the left. We're not loyal to the right. We are loyal to anti-imperialism. We're trying to build an anti-imperialist movement. And that's a positive movement focused on love and community and love of country, love of community, strength, brotherhood, you know, and socialist economics, because the banks and the factories and the industries and the centers of economic power should serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We should have an economy based on human need not the greed of a wealthy few, right? That's that's what we're talking about, um, you know? So anyway, I'm going to put on this brief, brief clip um, just to, you know, I, I love this clip because it just shows you what CPI does. I mean, what our movement is about, right? Looks a lot different than the rallies that certain other organizations have. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's what we need. We need to build a real, genuine anti-imperialist movement in the United States of America. And that means uh, going lower and deeper to the real masses. That means putting forward an optimistic message. That means not saying I hate you uh, to everyone in the country, but rather putting forward an optimistic message. Um, and I mean, look, we got to be outraged. I mean, this this budget, uh, the fact that they can spend ninety five billion billion dollars to prolong Israel's crimes against the Palestinians, to prolong the war in Ukraine, to polarize and increase tension in the South China Sea between the government on Taiwan and the mainland People's Republic of China. That's wrong. Uh, and it must be opposed. I mean, we've got to oppose this. And I, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to get into a, a state of demoralization because you see this happen that the fact that you know i i'm happy that it took them so long to agree to finally do this but it is absolutely outrageous it is absolutely outrageous completely outrageous uh completely completely outrageous what congress did today um also i believe that there was something about tiktok today did they did they make a decision about tiktok what did they decide with the tiktok ban well, the House of Representatives passed the TikTok ban today. Um, so it looks like, you know, we're, we're waiting for the Senate, but it looks like they're going to try to ban TikTok, right? Um, and again, uh, you know, TikTok is the one app they don't control, right? Google is, you know, the G in Google stands for government. 
right? Um, I mean, the, the anti-TikTok campaign is absolutely ridiculous. Um, the, the, you know, Twitter is cooperating with the FBI. We see the Twitter files. They used Twitter and Facebook you'll remember, to meddle in the U.S. elections. Uh, The FBI sat down with Mark Zuckerberg and with the Twitter owners and told them to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story. Um, But no one's talking about banning them because they're working with the deep state. But TikTok is one app that they don't have total control over. And so they've moved ahead with trying to ban TikTok. This is outrageous. This is absolutely outrageous. It is utterly ridiculous, Um, you know, and I see routinely in Republican circles, people blaming what all of social media is doing on TikTok, uh, which is ridiculous. Um, You know, uh, it's absolutely ridiculous, right? Blaming what all of social media does on TikTok. Oh, TikTok is making our kids crazy. No, Facebook is making our kids crazy. Twitter is making our kids crazy. Google is making our kids crazy. Is TikTok possibly contributing to that? Maybe, but they're not the main culprit. And in fact, they're the one one outlet that that is not completely under the control of the American government. Um, You know, so the American Congress is doing pretty outrageous things, right? And this comes, this accompanies the prosecution of the Uhuru movement. Um, You know, the, the Uhuru Three, uh, African American activists, uh, they've been indicted as Russian agents by the federal government. Um, and they're set to go on trial, uh, you know, on September 3rd, uh, their trial will begin and I intend to be in the courtroom. I hopefully will be covering it for RT. If not, I'll take the day off work and I'm going to Miami, uh, because that case sets a horrendously dangerous precedent if they can go ahead and, um, you know, uh, and, and prosecute people just for having some Zoom calls and talking about Russia, uh, they can put anybody in jail. They're, they can make it illegal to be an anti-imperialist. And we have got to stand against that. And you know who has spoken up in support of the Uhuru movement? Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson has spoken up in support of the Uhuru movement. He had Chairman O'Malley on his podcast. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, He had he did a whole interview with Chairman O'Malley. Um, Here, I'll show you my favorite clip from the interview where Chairman O'Malley made Tucker Carlson laugh. Right. This is Tucker Carlson is a lifelong conservative right wing Republican. And Chairman O'Malley is a lifelong communist, a lifelong communist black revolutionary, African internationalist communist. And the two of them laughed and recently on Joe Rogan, um, you know, on the the Joe Rogan podcast, they mentioned, um, you know, there was mention of the Uhuru movement case. Um, That's amazing, right? There's amazing things happening right now. Um, You know, uh, I mean, the fact that Tucker Carlson is defending the Uhuru movement, that is utterly amazing. Um, It's it's great. It's a huge step forward uh, that that is happening. We should all be very, very happy about that. Um, I'm trying to get the clip. I I don't know why the clip is not cooperating right now, but hopefully it's just not cooperating. That is really, really weird. Maybe I can can do it from another angle here. I've never had this this problem before. Every time I click to download the clip, um, it gives me a strange screen, but that's okay. I'll, I'll do it this way. So I want to show you the clip of, uh, of, of Chairman O'Malley, a communist, a black revolutionary anti-imperialist communist, and Tucker Carlson, a lifelong conservative, and just how they bonded together, how they, they laughed together. I mean, it was amazing. And the interview made such an impression that Joe Rogan, when he had Tucker Carlson on his podcast, he talked about it, you know, uh, the Tucker of all the interviewees to talk about. He talked about about this case um, here. I'm going to show you this is this is uh, this is when Chairman O'Malley made made Tucker Carlson laugh. Right. Um, here. All righty. 
Well, but I'm conf I'm incredible. confused. So you're describing basically what the Black Lives Matter people said four years ago. They got some of them got legit rich out of it. You don't seem like you've gotten rich, and they they got all this money from Apple, the biggest companies in the world, and of course the media cheerled them. What, how did you miss out on that? Well, because the thing is, like to say Black Lives Matter uh, is such an empty slogan. It's a whine rather than a demand. Uh, it's so <laughs> empty. I mean, Joe, Joe, you know, Joe Biden says Black Lives Matter. I mean, you got the whole Democratic uh, uh, Party, you know, Congress and whatever, get out on one knee with Kente cloth from Ghana on the, over their shoulder saying Black Lives Matter. Because it doesn't mean anything. It's a it's a non-statement. But what we yeah. say is black people have to have power. So we want power over our own life. That's the question. And that's the basis for the difference in how they would treat Black Lives Matter and how they would treat us. And, and you're right. The Black Lives Matter slogan is almost a Zuckerberg manufactured slogan. Certainly, if it's not manufactured by Zuckerberg, it's certainly promoted uh, by Zuckerberg yeah. and, and all the white people who love us. Yeah. I mean, that is... That is amazing. And also what Chairman O'Malley said there is true, right? I mean, he said that Black Lives Matter, right? Maybe the sentiment is certainly legitimate. Police terror and police repression is something the black community faces at, at, and has been organizing against. And I was organizing around that issue long before it was trendy and hip. You can read an article that they profiled me in Cleveland Scene Magazine for my police brutality work. You know, I, I was organizing around that years before it was the hip, cool thing to do. Um, you know, uh, you know, you know, despite that, I'm still labeled a white supremacist and a fascist, but it's a real issue. But Black Lives Matter is not a demand. There's nothing that changes when you just say Black Lives Matter. And it's become, you know, it's just become a polarizing thing, right? It's not stop the police state, right? It's not, um, it's not strengthen and build up the black community. It's just a statement that very easily gets people fired up, right? And because, I mean, and we know this history. I mean, and I'm sorry, but anyone who's ever dealt with, um, anyone who's ever dealt with, with low-income white people, unfortunately, a really common attitude among low-income white people is for them to say, you know, to get very defensive and angry when you talk about racism because they've experienced hardship in their lives themselves. And that's a really common thing that you see. And that's because there is no acknowledgement of class oppression, right? We do as a society to some degree or other acknowledge racial discrimination, but there's no acknowledgement of class oppression. White people are constantly being told that they have it too good. And if you're a white person, who's in a trailer, if you're a white person who's got relatives in prison or relatives in the military, and the message coming at you from Black Lives Matter is your life is too good, you're going to be hostile to that message. Now, is it a reality that your life is better because you're white? Yes, right? And that as bad as your life might be, it would be worse if on top of everything else, you were black, right? And, and, People don't want to acknowledge that. And that can be very difficult for people to acknowledge. But it would be a lot easier for people to acknowledge if there was awareness that things like health care, things like lack of economic opportunity, things like crumbling infrastructure, these things represent a, a, the oppression of the working class. Right. Um, but there's not acknowledgement of that. And Black Lives Matter is a very convenient way of not raising any societal issues. It is a moralistic thing, right? And wealthier college educated white people who go to college and take a class on white privilege, they, part of their training, right? Is that they learn to always make sure to put a BLM bumper sticker on the back of their, of their, uh, their bike or their scooter as they're driving around in their smug moral superiority. Whereas, you know, lower income white folks resent it because it feels like it is not acknowledging the hardship that they experience, which is very real, real. And, you know, the woke left goes out of its way to deny such things, right? If you talk about healthcare, 
right? The Medicare for all marches. You remember the Medicare for all marches that, that happened a few years back, right? Before the pandemic, there was Medicare for all marches. And the woke left and the Party of Socialism and Liberation, and all of them declared those Medicare for all marches to be white supremacist and racist marches because they were talking about an issue that brings people of different races together. How dare they, right? And force the vote. Jimmy Dore raised force the vote, saying that members of Congress should do basically the same thing that that Republicans are doing, you know, did to Kevin McCarthy and and demand, make demands on the door, um, you know, because I mean, how dare he? How dare he, you know, want, um, you know, want to talk about an economic issue and not just focus on on alienating white people and lecturing them about how their lives are too good. And, you know, I mean, Chairman O'Malley, I mean, he may not agree with me on everything, but the point that he's making in this clip is that Black Lives Matter as a slogan was promoted from the highest levels, from the, the biggest airlines, from the military industrial complex, Boeing and all of that. And it didn't actually demand anything that changed the actual conditions. Um, I thought it was a great point he made. And Chairman O'Malley, the reason that Tucker Carlson is defending him is because of the fact that he's at odds with the system. Tucker Carlson is at odds with the system as well. He was fired from Fox News. He, you know, became a, uh, you know, brave enough to go interview Russian President Vladimir Putin. The so-called left wants him in jail just for interviewing the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Um, you know, so Tucker Carlson is at odds with the deep state. And so is the Uhuru movement. And they're being indicted. Right. That's the question. What side are you on? What side are you on? That is the question. What side are you on? Right. And you can tell what side people are on because good people get canceled. Good people get smeared. Good people, you know, get demonized and told everyone gets told that good people are bad. And um, that's the way it works. That's the way these things work, um, you know. Um, and Tucker Carlson. And the Uhuru movement are getting along. Meanwhile, the Party of Socialism and Liberation uh, is actually trying to sabotage the Uhuru movement. It tried to sabotage their national rally that they had. Uh, and they, they tried to push them and, and sabotage their rally, uh, which was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. You know, PSL claims to support the Uhuru movement, but I never see them on any of the Uhuru calls. I never see them at any rallies supporting the Uhuru movement. And then they tried to sabotage their national rally. Why? Because PSL is part of the establishment. You know, um, the other thing is there's certain Twitch streamers and certain internet personalities that claim to love Tucker Carlson, that claim to be also against that. You never see them talk about the Uhuru case either. They don't do any coverage of the Uhuru case, you know, um, and they also never talk about economics and they never talk about class struggle. They want to direct everything back to a culture war. It's just instead of calling people homophobic, they call people homophobic slurs. Well, you're still, you know, redirecting the conversation in a negative way, right? I mean, we want to talk about economics. We want to talk about opposing war and opposing the system, the economic system that drives these wars and this impoverishment of the world. We want to talk about supporting the rising opposition around the world, the new economy that's emerging to challenge the power of Wall Street. We want to talk about the great things that Iran is doing, the great things that the Houthis are doing, the great things that the Venezuelans and the Nicaraguans are doing, the great things that Russia and China are doing, that, that Crimea Kerch bridge that Russia built. We want to talk about the, the Belt and Road Initiative and the high-speed railway that China is constructing and how there is a whole new world emerging now with an economy that's based on growth and development not impoverishment. That's what we want to talk about. And there's a lot of jokers and clowns out there who don't want to talk about that, right? I mean, and when it really gets down to it, and I, I come back to this, I came to this conclusion during a podcast I was recording with Jyoti Brar and Harper Brar. When it really gets down to it, Leninism, Lenin said it's about imposing imperialism. When Lenin formed the Bolshevik Party, he broke with the, you know, um, he broke with, with the existing socialist movement of his time. And he said it's about opposing imperialism. And he wrote this beautiful essay called Imperialism and the Split in Socialism. It's 10 pages long and you should read it. 
right? And that, that essay is the basis for the book he later wrote called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. But Lenin wrote this book called Imperialism and the Split in Socialism, this, this 10-page essay, where he just explained it, imperialism and the split in socialism. And it's not about workers and the bosses anymore. And it's not about uh, labor unions. I mean, labor unions are good, but they're, most of them are at this point dominated by the class enemy. It's about opposing imperialism. That is what it's all about. It's about opposing imperialism. And that's it, right? That is the battle in the world today. When the Bolsheviks took power in Russia, they, they offered military support to the emir of Afghanistan. They called the Congress of the Peoples of the East, right? And, and they, they said, we'll work with anybody who opposes the British Empire. Right? That's what it's all about. It's about opposing imperialism. And all the forms of fake leftism and all the distractions, all of the deviations, all of the fake revolutionary movements, whether they be left wing or right wing or whatever, they are all about not opposing imperialism. And that is what defines them. Trotskyism is about not opposing imperialism. Social democracy is about not opposing imperialism. Anarchism is about not opposing imperialism. Fascism is about not opposing imperialism. All of the deviations, all of the fake movements that are fomented by the imperialists to try and stabilize and control the masses in a crisis and to try and redirect the masses away from the revolution that they need, all of them are about not opposing imperialism. That's it. That's what unifies all of them. Some of them want to make the imperialist United States a more uh, diverse and, and multi-ethnic society. Some of them want there to be worker cooperatives so that the workers get a share of the profits. The workers who work at the huge multinational corporations that dominate the world get a share of the profits. Some of the movements, uh, you know, are about, 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 I don't know what they're about, about feminism. Some of them are about, they're all about something other than opposing imperialism. They're about, they're about something else. They're about making the Western imperialist homelands more stable by having more of a welfare state so they can better colonize the rest of the world. They're about, about uh, you know, reinforcing the nationalism and the drive to colonize the world, rebuilding the military, you know, or what? That's not opposing imperialism. It's about opposing imperialism. It is about anti-imperialism. And that's what it's all about. And that is, I mean, if you read the new textbook that we put out for our retreat in Vermont, that is basically what we laid out. And we went over the history of all the great movements to oppose imperialism that have existed in America, right? Out of the movement to the masses. We won't fight another rich man's war. Anti-imperialist organizing in America. What's this book about? This book is about opposing imperialism. That's what it's about. It is about opposing imperialism and how we need to build a movement to oppose imperialism. It's not enough, not enough to, to just talk about opposing imperialism. It's not enough to have YouTube broadcasts about opposing imperialism. It's about building a real movement to oppose imperialism. And that's what the Uhuru movement was doing. And in the black community, they built real schools, real farmer mar farmers markets, and real infrastructure to oppose imperialism. And that is why they have been targeted, right? Uh, I mean, because they built a real movement to oppose imperialism. They didn't just talk about opposing imperialism, right? You're, they're, you're allowed to just talk about opposing imperialism. And you're also allowed to build some kind of fake movement that's not really about opposing imperialism, right? If you just talk on the internet, they don't mind. And on top of that, if you just, uh, if you build a movement to oppose Donald Trump and conservatives like the Communist Party is doing, they don't mind, right? And if you build a movement to, uh, to you know, tell average Americans that they're the enemy and they're all a bunch of racist white settlers and they all need to, you know, you know, move back to Europe so that Native Americans can take over the United States or whatever the hell PSL is talking about, they don't mind that. 
right? And if you build a movement that says the enemy is China and America first means opposing China and banning TikTok, they don't mind that. And if you get on social media and you talk, they don't mind that. What they mind is if you build a real movement. That's what Fred Hampton was killed for. That's why the FBI crushed the Communist Party. Um, but that is what we urgently need. We need to build a real movement. This is, I think, you know, uh, this is, I've got my video on the Uhuru case, um, you know, because again, Uhuru is facing heavy government repression because they are building a real movement. After the rioting was, was done, U.S. media kind of forgot about those communities. Well, Uhuru, they went out there because they saw black and brown people like themselves that were out there protesting and rioting. And uh, they stayed there, and they've been there since 2014, providing services in the community, uh, giving these young people in the community something constructive to do, not just go out and break shit to raise awareness about the conditions they're in, but ways to actually feed people and serve the community. And they've been there uh, in St. Louis since 2014, doing constructive work. Uh, they have really escalated these programs. They have a farmer's market. Uh, they provide classes and services to pregnant mothers, and in particular in St. Louis, Missouri, and in uh, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. They're trying to undo the damage that the U.S. Department of Justice and the, the state police and the local police and all the forces have been doing in communities like Ferguson, Missouri. And at the same time that they've done this community work, um, the African People's Socialist Party uh, has also taken a firm anti-imperialist stance. They support China. They support Russia. They support Cuba. They support Iran. And when the United States uh, started piling weapons into Kiev, um, they defended Russia's right uh, to intervene. This defensive war in Ukraine that Russia is actually waging against world colonial powers, not Ukraine as a single entity, but the U.S. and all colonial powers who have an interest and colonially dominating African people right here in this country and around the world and extracting resources from the majority of peoples on the planet. That system, this current system, is in severe crisis and they cannot rule in the same old way. Because of that, their homes were raided. Then months later, uh, the federal government came out with an indictment and it's charging them with being Russian agents. And it's trying to allege that the election campaign that they ran in St. Petersburg, Florida, was somehow interference in the U.S. electoral process. Four activists associated with the People's Democratic Uhuru Movement and the African People's Socialist Party have been indicted by the U.S. Department of Justice. The indictment from the U.S. Department of Justice accuses them of spreading Russian propaganda and cites uh, simply some web conferences that they had, uh, some Zoom meetings, uh, some emails they sent out, as well as the, the fact that they have run routine election campaigns. Is this of concern to the Secretary general as an attack on human rights, uh, freedom of assembly, etc. I frankly am not was not aware of the case before you mentioned it. Let me look into it and I will get back to you. What's going on in Africa is directly connected to what's going on here. What's going on in Ukraine is connected to what's going on in, in Harlem. You know, so it's the international global economy that's all connected. Because they go to conferences in Russia, this constitutes Russian meddling in the elections. The whole thing is ridiculous. It's completely, utterly ridiculous. They've been running these campaigns for years, since before I was born. Back in the 1970s, they were running people for office. Their platform of reparations. I mean, Marion Williamson, she's a major Democrat candidate. She also says she believes in reparations. I mean, it's not a unique message that they have in that sense, but they have been targeted because they're doing what you're supposed to do. I mean, you know, at all of our meetings, we have a picture of Fred Hampton up on the stage because Fred Hampton, he built a free breakfast program. He organized what he called a rainbow coalition, uniting low-income people, white, black, brown, Arab, Latino, into one organization, you know, trying to build up community empowerment, uh, trying to do community service projects while teaching Marxism and socialism. You know, we look at Fred Hampton as a great example of the American revolutionary tradition. And, you know, the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru movement, you know, they don't like that we wave the American flag. Uh, they don't like that we consider ourselves patriotic. They have their own kind of unique analysis. They talk about what they call the colonial mode of production. That's not traditional Marxist thinking. And we don't agree with them on a number of issues but it doesn't matter, we support them. We all have to stand up and oppose the ideology of division and support uh, an ideology of, of unity based upon our material interests, you know what I'm saying, to, to work together. People who can't understand that, people who can't get past, you know, this or that, like, we gotta put aside our, our differences and say that if, if they come for them, they come for all of us. If they, they go after them, they gotta deal with all of us. That needs to be the attitude among anti-imperialists. Yeah. Yeah, you know, before we went to uh, the World Youth Festival, we actually had a press conference at the United Nations. Um, you know, I'll put that on.
Uh, thank you. You know, um, hold on. When the youth office of the Russian foreign ministry reached out to me about forming a national preparatory committee for the upcoming World Youth Festival set for March in Russia. As someone who attended the World Festival of Youth and Students in 2013 in Quito, Ecuador, uh, someone who attended the festival that was held in Sochi in 2017, as an advocate of socialism, peace, and international cooperation, as an American patriot, as a Christian, and someone who strives to live according to the teachings of Jesus Christ, I considered this to be a great opportunity. However, it is the circumstances of our upcoming trip that bring us here today. As we meet here today, Jesse Neville, Penny Hess, and Omali Yashatella have been indicted by the U.S. Department of Justice. They are facing a possible 15 years in prison. Uh, their trial date was just set for September. Uh, the Biden administration has charged them for doing what we are about to do, for going to an international conference in Russia. The Biden administration has declared that they're putting on some Zoom calls, writing some articles about Ukraine, uh, that that has been conspiracy to act as a foreign agent. And this case is absolutely outrageous. It's an attack on freedom of assembly, freedom to travel, freedom of speech, and freedom of association. And it's designed to intimidate Americans from doing what we plan to do, visit Russia and question U.S. foreign policy. In light of this horrific indictment, it is very important that we go to Russia to show that we will not be intimidated and to take responsibility for the future amid the utter failure of the Biden administration. Biden said he would end the war in Yemen. And as we all know, now that war is expanding and U.S. bombs are being dropped on Yemen. Biden has poured billions of dollars of American taxpayer money into Ukraine to prolong this war at the same time that our bridges and highways are crumbling and our living standards are dropping and American working families are being squeezed by inflation. Under these circumstances, with Biden trying to intimidate Americans and weaponizing the Department of Justice against dissidents, and with international tensions rising, we have a duty to go to Russia and show the world another America. Because there are two Americas. Beyond Wall Street and Hollywood and the vast territories of the American heartland, you will find a lot of hardworking people who love their children, love their communities, and want a better life. You will find an America that values peace, not war. It is this America that produced Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Black Panthers, the great abolitionist John Brown, and it's this America that produced the labor movement that pushed forward uh, Roosevelt, the great anti-fascist coalition that propelled the United States to align with the Soviet Union to defeat the menace of fascism in a great moment in history, also to align with China. It is this America the America that's been hidden from mainstream TV, the America that has been canceled by the social media monopolies. It's this America of the working class, of small business owners and people of many different races and ethnic backgrounds who reject war and the emerging low-wage police state. It is this America and its democratic traditions that I will be proudly representing in Sochi. There's a new economy arising in the world today centered around the BRICS, the Eurasian Economic Union, the Belt and Road Initiative of China, and the real America would benefit from joining with this new economy, trading with countries on the basis of win-win cooperation, and ending the wars, the threats, and the sanctions. The Center for Political Innovation sees Russia as an ally of the real America, and we call for the charges against the Uhuru Three to be immediately dropped, and we look forward to making lots of new friends at the upcoming World Youth Festival. Not just youth from Russia, but youth from the 188 different countries that will be represented at this vitally important international gathering. Thank you. Yeah, that was my remarks. But hey, um, you know, I know we got a lot of uh, super chats to answer tonight. But before we do, I want to just show because Africa is so important right now. Africa is shifting into the anti-imperialist camp, right? West Africa. I mean, there's a number of countries where the UN and the US troops are leaving Niger and elsewhere. Um, 
And, you know, one figure who was really a pioneer of the anti-imperialist and anti-colonial struggle uh, in Southern Africa was Robert Mugabe. And, you know, this was an interview done by Robert Mugabe before he was victorious, before they took power. And in it, Robert Mugabe explains socialism very effectively. So I just wanted to put on this Robert Mugabe, this very old Robert Mugabe interview. Um, this is Robert Mugabe kind of explaining how socialism is about growth, uh, what he wants for the African people. Not fight these grievances by pleading for their rectification. You can only do so by getting to the root cause of the problem. And that's the, the, uh, the problem of power. But at that point, you were firmly committed to achieving power through the ballot box. Yes, through the ballot box, that's at right. what stage did you very first consider that it might be necessary, in your view, to use a gun? To use petrol bombs as far back as 1960, and we were the first to use them, but purely as a means of pressure, not really to try and destroy life, but to intimidate um, the authorities into conceding, as it were, to our wishes. Did it work? It didn't work. Then we had um, demonstrations and uh, strikes. She participated in one of the most, uh, best organized demonstrations in the country, the women's demonstration. Thousands of them were sent to prison in Salisbury and thousands sent to prison in, in Bulawayo and Guelo and Umtali in 1961. It must be a terrible responsibility to have to bear to know that you were instrumental in starting a war. I mean, however just you feel a conflict to be. No, 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 no. He said that I, I didn't feel any conflict at all. I felt justified. There was a whole history of our having tried non-violent methods. They had failed completely. And um, neither the uh, settler regime nor Britain heeded our cries. They just... Uh, uh, wouldn't move, they wouldn't yield an inch. And so we decided, uh, without any uh, qualms about it, that armed struggle would uh, be the right thing. Fighting a war, which is a very difficult one, but in spite of the difficulties posed by the enemy, we take care not to make people unnecessarily suffer. But I quote from your own publication, Zimbabwe News. All land to the tillers, socialism now. You have to hit a racist settler in the groin and skull hard, very hard, very, very hard, before you can get him to scream those words. That's what we proposed. That's what we will continue to do till final victory. Let us never forget that only a dead imperialist is a good one. Now, is that the kind of language that's likely to make soldiers behave responsibly? This is only a dramatic way of saying we are waging a struggle to overthrow the settler system. It does not literally mean that uh, we go all out to destroy the whites. No, we are fighting a just war aimed at the overthrow of the settler government, which is presently oppressing our people. As you see, I wonder whether language like that might not incite young men to commit the most appalling acts within the conflict. No one is fighting an individual war. All our fighters are fighting collectively under a command that, that derives its authority from the Central Committee. This question has been asked before, and I think what people would want to know is whether those who have committed genocide and massacres uh, will become our friends tomorrow. I don't know what uh, the Allies would have answered if, the, if a qu similar question had been asked in 1945-1946, whether Hitler and Mus Mussolini would become the Allies of Churchill and uh, Roosevelt. Um, our answer is that those who are architects of this genocide and massacres surely must, on uh, the basis of moral and uh, legal principles, be brought to trial. But this does not mean that the followers, the ordinary person, must be tried. Those who have hatched the uh, plan, the treason, as a result of which uh, massacres of all kinds have been perpetrated against our people and against the people of Mozambique.
people of Zambia, Angola and Botswana surely must be brought to book for their crime. It is absolutely wrong to allow a set of individuals to acquire the ownership and possession of resources which are God-given. They are not man-made. The land, the water, the forests, the animals, the fish in the river, the minerals, these are given us by nature. And it is in principle wrong for any one man to claim ownership of such resources. We should belong to the people as a whole. This is how serious revolutionaries talk, right? That is what a scientific revolutionary sounds like. Robert Mugabe, right? He was the guy who led, he led his people to wage the Rhodesian Bush War to defeat the apartheid state of Rhodesia to establish modern Zimbabwe. They signed a peace treaty that meant for 10 years there would be no change in property, no redistribution of property. And after that 10 years was up, he redistributed the farmland of Zimbabwe. The mines of Zimbabwe are nationalized, uh, the diamond mines. Um, and now, you know, one of the great natural wonders of the world uh, is the um, Victoria Falls. Uh, which is the biggest waterfall in the world. And now, thanks to China, there is a beautiful hotel overlooking the Victoria Falls. Um, you know, and China and Zimbabwe are like this. And Russia and Zimbabwe are like this. And Zimbabwe, uh, under the leadership of an anti-colonial revolutionary who redistributed the land, is trying and very effectively raising its people up out of poverty. Um, and it, you know, has inspired a wave of anti-colonial revolutions. If you see what's just been happening in Niger, what's been happening in Burkina Faso, this is this is this is all a continuation. None of this would have ever happened without the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. The world is rising up against imperialism, and it's about time the American people rise up against imperialism. Here's another clip. Uh, this isn't Mugabe, but this is another Zimbabwe revolutionary explaining what they stood for, what their anti-colonial movement was about. <clears throat> You seem to dwell a lot on this question of socialism. Now, what you are trying to say to me, or what you are trying to suggest to me, what has been suggested to us uh, over and over again, is that this idea of socialism will not work. In other words, we are being persuaded to get stuck with capitalism. During the 1920s, the 1930s, our fathers, our forefathers worked like slaves, getting paid almost nothing to build the, uh, the economic infrastructure. Now, is it not common sense that when we fight to liberate the country and want to introduce a new system, we should, start, we should look for a system which is different from capitalism? There is an expression in England don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I wonder if you look around Europe or Africa, whether you really believe that it's the socialist countries that are more efficient and happier. I'm absolutely convinced that um, I would be happier in a socialist country. I've recently been to the United States, the show of capitalism there, uh, the way it plays on your mind, even on television when you ought to get more acquainted about the things that matter around the world. No, I shouldn't like to live under such a system. Come to power, what would it mean for the ordinary small trader, the farmer, businessman? We will obviously collectivize the national pillars of the economy. Uh, I mean mining, for example, railways, aerodesia, um, you know, the finance houses, those top uh, uh, occupations which have national repercussions. But the government, the, from our point of view, the government has no business selling matches or Coca-Cola, for example, uh, to people. The government has no, has no business in, uh, in running a dry cleaning shop, uh, for example. Uh, it, it, those um, small distributive um, and other social services are better left to the individual, 
to individuals who want to promote the quality of life. So that the, the fear of some state running down, uh, running human affairs right down to, uh, to the family uh, is, is foreign to, to, to our people, is foreign to our thinking, uh, and we have no intention of creating a system like that. Socialism, yes, but it does not mean totalitarian dispossession. Yeah. Um, yeah, again, these are how serious revolutionaries talk, right? They talk about economics. They explain their economic model. They advocated, they, they preferred a peaceful transition to socialism through the ballot box, through peaceful demonstrations. But when that was cut off, uh, they engaged in armed struggle. Um, they advocate a, a system of public ownership of the means of production in order to raise people up out of poverty. This is this is how serious revolutionaries talk. Woke people don't talk this way. No, with woke people, it's all white cis gender privilege and racist white males and and you know and you know patriarchy and and they talk about everything but this. Eh? What you just heard from Robert Mugabe, what you just heard from that great. African revolutionary leader, that is what real revolutionaries talk about. There's nothing in there about, about, you know, any of the garbage that woke people talk about. It's all just about, look, we are oppressed in our own land. We want to take control of the economy. We want to organize the economy to serve us, the people who live here. Um, pretty basic, right? Nobody talks that way except the Center for Political Innovation. We talk that way. Right, because we understand what this is all about, and it's all about opposing imperialism, imperialism, capitalism in its monopoly stage. That is the main danger. That is the main danger. That is what it's all about opposing. And all the other forms of fake leftism are all another uh, something else to do other than opposing imperialism. It's all about opposing imperialism. It's about building an anti monopoly coalition. It's about building a movement for jobs, schools, health care, and education. It's about saying money for jobs and not for war, money for schools and not for war. It's about demanding public control of the major centers of economic power. It's about our four-point plan. You look at the CPI website, we have a four-point economic plan. And it's a plan that challenges the power of the big corporations. Um, that's what it is, right? Um, you know, that's what we advocate. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Um, you know, and I just I keep reply, I keep emphasizing this right over and over and over again, because it's just not said enough. Right. We have to oppose imperialism. We have to talk about the economics of imperialism. Right. We have to we have to build a movement of Americans who are opposed to imperialism a movement that's not going to tear each other down over social justice fighting, a movement that's not going to tail after the Democrats, a movement that doesn't see the American people as the enemy, right? A movement that could build up a mass base of support among the population. That is what we have to do. And it's not easy. And there's a million shortcuts. There's a million shortcuts, right? You know, uh, but none of those shortcuts are going to do it. And it's hard. It's very hard to do what we aspire to do. It's not easy. Right. You know, to hold a group together. Right. There's a reason that the Uhuru movement has been indicted. There's a reason uh, that, you know, that that I've been targeted the way I've been targeted and other people have been targeted. Right. There's a reason for all of that. Right. If you actually fight them, if you're not running a circus to distract them, if you're actually fighting them, uh, they will push back against you. Uh, but we have a responsibility as the American wing of the global city building tendency, right? The people, the part of the world that believes in growth as the American wing of that movement, we have a responsibility to do everything we can, everything we possibly can to actually win, uh, you know? And again, it's not easy. Uh, again, there's difficulties. Again, you know, people are gonna not appreciate us and there's a million rewards for going the other way. There's a million rewards for, for finding some way to not do this. Um, and it's hard to do what we're doing, 
but we are going to do what we're doing. And if you look at the year in review uh, video that we did last year, you saw that the year 2023, we accomplished amazing things. And this is the year of 2024. It's only April. So far, what have we done? We had a national day of action to stand with the Houthis in Yemen, right? Where people all across the country supported the Houthis. Then we published a book about the Houthi movement that was the top book in Yemen history and the top book in war, the third top book in War and Peace, this, this book was like a top selling book on Amazon about the Houthis, supporting the Houthis. We're in the process. Uh, Alex Rickle is in the process of making an audio book of this book. Then we had a UN press conference where we announced we were going to the World Youth Festival and we raised the Uhuru case at the United Nations. And then we went to the World Youth Festival. And at the World Youth Festival, we uh, we led the American delegation and we had meetings. Wait till you see this video that Peter Coffin is working on. We had meetings with communist revolutionary youth from around the world. And we got to speak to the Russian president, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. I was an election observer, right? I observed the Russian election and, you know, and spoke with, and I was there with Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney. I was there with Dan Kavalik and Tara Reid and others. And we, we observed the Syrian election or the, the Russian election, all right? Uh, I mean, you know, and now we're getting ready to have a four-day training school in Vermont. We are building a real anti-imperialist movement, a movement that stands with Yuhuru, a movement that stands with Russia, stands with China, stands with Africa, and the country's breaking free from imperialism, stands with, uh, with, with Vietnam, stands with Nicaragua and Cuba and Venezuela. We're doing it. We're doing, we're doing it. We're building a real movement and it must be done. And there's no shortcut and there's no way around doing it. And, um, so I'm going to put on the video for our, our Vermont retreat, and then we'll do the roll call and then I'll start answering people's super chat questions. So, yeah. The movement to the masses, April 26th to 29th, Vermont. Center for Political Innovation National Educational Workshop. Friends and allies, as U.S. society braces for an election year amid international turmoil and a decaying economy, many are looking, not just for answers, but for what they can do to change the course of history. How can we get involved? How can we make things better? The synthetic left offers nothing but cancel culture, pessimism, and anti-human sentiments. Often, this channels dissidence toward the right wing, which is wrapped up in the worship of markets and profits and has no real understanding of the global imperialist system and why it must be opposed, or the history of struggles for justice. With our unique message of optimistic, constructive, patriotic socialism and anti-imperialism, the Center for Political Innovation and the City Building Tendency stand alone in offering an orientation that points toward a brighter future for America's working families and the people of the world. The City Building Tendency is a fresh outlook rooted in an understanding of Marxism-Leninism and the global anti-imperialist movement, and draws from many wells, including Christianity, American history, and so much more. While the Center for Political Innovation has blossomed around a unique pro-humanity, pro-growth message, we aim to take this message further, lower and deeper to the real masses, so that the American working class may be awakened and brought to life by standing arm in arm with others in the struggle for justice. If you are a member of the Center for Political Innovation, a longtime friend or ally, or someone new who is exploring these ideas and concepts, we invite you to join us this spring. The Center for Political Innovation will host a four-day national educational workshop at a beautiful facility in Vermont. The event will not only include political classes, but also group bonding activities. A talent show. Music. arts and crafts, and other relaxing and stress-free activities. Attendees will get to know each other, share their experiences, and develop real bonds of comradeship. Many have been inspired by the book, We Are City Builders, the Center for Political Innovation Educational Manual. This book has been utilized to lead discussion groups and has also laid the foundation for the series of classes known as the Saxton Lectures, which CPI members around the country have been trained to give as a way of teaching the basics of anti-imperialism, socialism, and the city building tendency. We are excited to announce that at the upcoming retreat, a completely new textbook, 
a second volume intended to complement the educational manual, will be available and presented to all attendees when they check in. This new textbook will focus on the history of socialist and anti-imperialist organizing in America, the divisions in the ruling class, and give perspective toward building a base of support for our message among the broader population. If you attend, you will be the first to sit through and participate in the discussions during the inauguration of a second level of model classes, much like the Saxton Lectures, that members will replicate in the process of building the organization. It will be very exciting to learn and engage together with all of this completely new material. We want to maximize attendance and not turn anyone away who is interested in the message. But from those who are able, we do request a $200 donation if possible to cover the food and other expenses for the four days of activities. For those who register, expect a follow-up call with CPI leadership to confirm your attendance and answer any questions you may have. You may also leave questions, additional details, or comments in the registration form. Please consider bringing a friend, family member, co-worker, or classmate who may be completely new to these ideas. We envision this workshop as being part of the process of CPI becoming better aligned with our organizational vision to the masses. Subsequently, new attendees and guests of friends and members are encouraged and welcomed and will be given priority throughout the four days of activities and classes. We look forward to seeing you in Vermont. Best wishes, the Center for Political Innovation. All right, everybody, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Uh, let's start doing the roll call. Names and locations. Names and locations. I will call you all out as I see you. Who is with us tonight? Names and locations. Names and locations. Who is with us? Who is with us? Names and locations. Names and locations. Who's with us tonight? Who is with us tonight? And then after that, I'll start answering questions. We got Mark Jones in Utica, New York. New, Utica, New York. We got Rice from Adelaide, Australia. Um, names and locations. Names and locations. Who else is with us tonight? Names and locations. We got Emperor Penguin from Texas. Welcome. We got Jenny Lynn in Cincinnati. Bob in Troy, New York. Jonathan in North Carolina. We got Laura in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we got Auckland, New Zealand. We got Ryan in Kansas City. Mosin from Iran. Tony in Tasmania. John McCarthy in Chicago. Scott in Maryland. SLC, Salt Lake City, Utah. Communist Majoritarian. Bendigo, David Fox. Steve and Ann in Ringgold, Georgia. We got St. David's Bermuda. Very, very good. JT24 in Mississippi. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got George Muniz in Sydney. We got Ray from... Madeira, California. We got Master Jack out in South Africa. We got Sherry in New Jersey. We got April and Chris in Salt Lake City. We got Patrick in Maine. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Names and locations. We got Quebec City. Very good. Very good. Quebec City. Quebec City. Names and locations. Names and locations. We got Montreal. We got Detroit. We got Alexander from Waterloo, Iowa. Waterloo, Iowa. We got Mark Shear in North Carolina. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Names and locations. Names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Names and locations. We got Mariah in North Carolina offering hugs to all. Well, that is great, Mariah, and my best wishes to you. Lillian in New Hampshire. Welcome, Lillian. So good to have you here tonight. Names and locations. Names and locations. Names and locations. Um, Sultan from Missagua. Uh, Big Love from Detroit, Pennsylvania. Ty Blee. Welcome, Ty Blee. Names and locations. Names and locations. Anybody else? Names and locations. Names and locations. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. So, um, oh, Tyler in Missouri, my favorite English teacher. Welcome, Tyler. Welcome, welcome. So glad you're here with us. Uh, I got to tell you, folks, there's a lot of exciting things in the lead up to the Detroit uh, to the upcoming retreat. Uh, it's going to be very, very exciting. It's going to be a great, great retreat. Oh, I've got an average American in Florida. Uh, you know, it's going to be great. Um, if you if you want to come, uh, I recommend it. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be really awesome. Uh, I really hope that you will make a point of attending. Um, you know, we still have space. You can still register um, if you'd like to come. 
Uh, there's still registration available. You can still attend. Um, however, there is another option uh, for those of you who perhaps, you know, uh, if you can't make it, if you can't join us in Detroit this next weekend coming up, uh, here's the link to register. There's still still time. You can go ahead and register. It'll be a fun, fun four day weekend, um, you know, but if you can't make it, if you can't join us, right, um, you can donate. Uh, you can donate. Um, and that that's appreciated as well. Um, you know, uh, there is there is a way that you can fund the retreat by just donating to CPI uh, to make sure that we have the funds necessary to do what we've got to do. You can donate uh, to the CPI. If you go to the website and hit donate, um, you know, here's the donation link. You can't make it and you're able to, um, you know, you're able to donate and help us do our work. That's one way to do it. So there you go. All righty. Um, so now I'm going to start answering people's super chat questions. Um, one at a time, keep them rolling in. Uh, you know, we got 13 to answer. So that's a lot of questions and I appreciate it. So this is going to be a very interesting second half of the show. Um, that's fine because you all ask good questions. So here we go. Reports about the passing of Russell Texas Bentley. Uh, he reminded me of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, how he left to fight for Donbass against the Nazis. I do, uh, I do recall the interview that I did with Russell Texas Bentley. Uh, it was a great interview. Um, he's certainly a heroic person who, uh, he, you know, he saw that the people of Eastern, you know, of Donbass were suffering and he went to go fight with them. Uh, he's a, a heroic individual, uh, and it looks like he ended up giving his life uh, on the battlefield. Um, you know, I don't know exactly the details of his passing, uh, but uh, it, it is deeply tragic and deeply sad. And uh, it was really an honor to be able to interview him on Rumble. Uh, I think I'll pull up the interview that I did with him. I posted it on Rumble. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it, it's... You know, it's it's sad. I mean, people I mean, you know, it's also what they did to Gonzalo Lira. Right. Um, let's not forget that. But, you know, there is there is a a very, very harsh reality that this is real and people are really dying. Um, you know, people are really dying. And this man was a real man and he had a real wife and a real family, et cetera. And uh you know, this is the interview that I did with him. Um, I guess I'll I'll tweet it out as well. I will, I'm tweeting. I will never forget my interview with Russell Texas Bentley, an internationalist hero of the working class. Um, I'm tweeting that out. I mean, I'm just I'm saddened by the whole thing. And it gets me back to why I get so emotional about this stuff, um, which is that I take this very, very, very seriously. Um, there are real people involved. There are real lives involved in this. And, you know, I don't have the luxury of not taking this seriously. Right. Uh, I, I don't. Some people can just half ass this. And some people can say, well, you know, it's OK that you know, it's okay. I could just go to a rally once in a while or, you know, I can't. Okay. And when I see, when I see organizations that are a road to nowhere, that are a trap, when I see the state of affairs on the so-called left, I can't just sit back and accept it. And I was in a group for eight years and I, I, I just can't, I have to do something. I have to intervene. I have to do what's not being done. I have to build an anti-imperialist movement. And that's why the Center for Political Innovation exists. Um, and I, I mean, when I was in Iran, you know, uh, I mean, I, I saw the Supreme Leader and I had that emotional situation. And I had my spiritual breakthroughs and such. And, and that, you know, I, I take this seriously. I take this very, very seriously. Russell, Texas is dead. Gonzalo Lira is dead. A lot of Yemenis are dead. A lot of Palestinians are dying around the clock. I mean, this is real. And the people who just sit on the internet and tear down other people or cuss up a storm or it doesn't help. 
And the people who build movements that are attached to wokeism, and there's no place for me, a lifelong leftist, right, let alone the majority of the American people in those movements, they're not helping either. We have to build a real anti-imperialist movement, right? And there's a reason that the cover of our new textbook, there's a reason that we picked the image that we picked. I will put it on the screen one more time because there's a reason we picked this image, okay? There's a reason, um, you know, there's a reason we picked this image, right? This is what a real anti-imperialist movement looks like. Black, white, veterans, we won't fight another rich man's war. A class understanding that the wars serve the rich and not working people. I mean, there's a reason we picked that as the cover. We need to build that kind of movement in America. That kind of movement needs to be built. A movement that talks like that. Right? And, um, you know, that, I think about Russell and I think about how he's no longer with us and he gave his life, you know, in the way that he knew how, right? That was what he could do. He decided he was going to go to Donetz and he was going to fight and good for him. And that's what he could do, you know? Um, and that's what he was called by God to do. That's what, what God had in mind for him to do. Um, and he was a very passionate person and he was from the U S state of Texas. That's why they called him Texas. That was his nickname when he was fighting in Ukraine. And, you know, I just think, you know, there's really nothing more to say except that the way the way to honor him is to do what we're called to do. And that's to build a real movement. Right? We got to build a real anti-imperialist movement. Uh, and there's no way around that. And there's no shortcuts. And there's no, you have to build a real anti-imperialist movement. So I, I just keep coming back to that. And that's what I'm harping on. And that's what needs to be done. And that's what we are desperately trying to do with CPI. And, you know, there's no substitute for it. And there's no excuse for not doing it. And we have to do it. And there is no alternative. All right. Noah asks, have you heard of the upcoming Trump biopic, The Apprentice? And what do you make of it? I haven't heard of it. Is there a trailer? It's weird because Trump is running for president. So how is that? Either that film is is a campaign, you know, video or it's anti, um, you know, I, I, I haven't heard about this. I don't watch much television. Um, but, uh, let's, let's watch the, uh, the trailer. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I just, I don't know. I mean, I'll say a couple things. Um, I never watched The Apprentice. Um, but there was a friend of mine, somebody I went to high school with. Um, and um, she and her father loved Donald Trump. And it wasn't political. It was because they watched The Apprentice together. It was like a thing they bonded over. And when Donald Trump announced he was running for president, she loved it. She was all over that. She was so excited because she had so many positive memories of her and her father watching The Apprentice show together. You know, um, and that shows there's a certain power in that kind of politics. You know, I mean, you know, you and I might think, well, what about Donald Trump's position? And what about he said about that? Yeah, but to a lot of people, right, you know, the feeling that they have about a person is not based on on, you know, this long drawn out analysis of their positions. It's based on it's based on the memories and the associations they have. And that that person I knew, you know, she was you know, politically different places. She wasn't as conservative as most of the people I grew up around. And, you know, but the second she found out Donald Trump was running to president, running for president, boom, she, she was all about it. And it wasn't about, uh, politics and it wasn't about immigration. It was about the fact that, you know, that, that she had these memories of the apprentice and that with her and her father watching that reality TV show with Donald Trump, it meant that to her, um, you know, the associations, it's very important, you know, and this is something that people in advertising talk about, and this is something that people in 
And when they, when you read books on public speaking, right? Um, I read a book once. Um, it was by a minister. It was about how to give good sermons. And he pointed out that, you know, if I say tree, if I just say tree, the image that comes into your mind for every person, it's going to be different, right? If you're, if you're in the Caribbean, it's going to be a palm tree. If, if you're in a mountainous region, it, it's probably going to be an evergreen tree, a pine tree, right? It could be an apple tree. It could be a maple tree. It could, you know, I mean, everyone has different experiences, right? And so the association that you have with something for every person is different. You know, I think about this, for example, right? I, when I hear a Southern accent, right, I find it very charming because my dad's family was from the South, you know, because I grew up in an area in Ohio where there are a lot of people from West Virginia. That's not exactly a Southern accent, but West Virginia folks have quite an accent, you know, and, and you know, and I've lived in New York City for a long time where I feel like kind of like I'm on the odd man out because I'm not, you know, from here. So I, I feel affection toward people with a Southern accent. Um, but there's a lot of people who, if they hear a Southern accent, they get triggered, right? They associate it with racism, right? A lot of black people, if they hear a white person with a Southern accent, they think that's a Klan guy. They think that's a white supremacist. <laughs> they're, they're totally justified. I mean, obviously, look at the history of the South. They're not wrong to feel that way, right? Um, you know, when I hear a Jersey accent, right? I, I mean, a really thick Jersey accent, it really doesn't appeal to me. But for some people, right, that's their mother. That's their grandmother. That's, you know, their their family. That's, you know, I mean, they, you know, I mean, you, you know, um, and the associations with anything, right, with certain foods, right? And, that, and, and I mean, you know, some people, I mean, depending on your experience, certain foods remind you of certain things, certain smells, and you're not even aware of it. That's the crazy thing. You're not even aware of the associations you might have. It can be subconscious, right? Right? I might. You know, there's many people who maybe they feel a certain way about a Southern accent, but if they meet somebody who's Southern, they're going to be influenced by that, but they might not even be aware of it, right? It can be subconscious. This is when people talk about racism, right? A lot of racism is not conscious. You know, people that are racist, um, you know, judge people by the color of their skin. A lot of times they're not consciously sitting there. Oh, that's a black. I don't like black. It's not like that, but they just have an association in their head with black people being whatever, and they treat black people badly based on that because they're subconscious, right? And that 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 applies to movies, that applies to films, that it applies to sounds, smells. I, I mean, we have all kinds of subconscious associations. So when you're in creating a work of art, when you're giving a speech, you're writing a book, right? One of the most difficult things is that you have to navigate the prejudices and the associations that you're audience might have right and you have to navigate that right and, and i guess this gets me back to my friend when you said the apprentice that was the name of the show that donald trump had for her donald trump was a very positive association not for reasons that donald trump would be associated for you and me right and that that you know that's important Right. And I, I've come back to that example before, but it's like associations and feelings are important. You know, I suppose if Donald Trump said something that she just really vehemently disagreed with, that might change her view. But with her, Donald Trump is always going to get the benefit of the doubt. And with her, Donald Trump is always going to be, um, you know, is going to be always, um, you know, she's going to try to like him because of the positive association she has with him, right? And we're all like this to some degree or other, right? With some people, it's more blatant than others. But I think in some cases, right, I think with her, it was very obvious. But with a lot of people, they suppress it. They pretend they don't have these biases. They tend they don't have these associations. Um, and, you know, that's when they talk about psycho psychoanalytic work. I mean, and part of that is digging into your subconscious and realizing what associations you might have with different things. Right. Um, you know, I mean, because a lot of people are not aware to a lot of people. Something might mean one thing where it means another thing. You have to be aware of your own biases. Be aware of your own associations. Be aware of your own weaknesses. Be aware of your own vulnerabilities, your own fears. This is really, really important stuff. Um 
and again, if you're if you're trying to create a work of art that people might enjoy, or you're trying to be persuasive in the way that you speak, uh, this this is all something you should really really think about. Um, so again, when I say tree, right? I just said tree. I bet there's there's over 200 people watching now. I bet every single person has a different image of a tree in their mind. Every single one of you, right? And that's what you have to remember. All of us have different associations. Anyway, next question. Um, also, it's the 21st of April in Australia. It's the anniversary of the date when the stonemasons won the eight-hour day in Melbourne, Victoria. That's a great, that's a great anniversary. We didn't get the eight-hour workday in the United States officially until the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. Um, you know, there were a lot of unions and a lot of states that had something like the eight hour day, but at a federal level, we did not get it until the Roosevelt administration, uh, the eight hour work day. Right. Um, and you know, why stop at eight hours, right? With computer technology, it ought to be seven hours. It ought to be five hours. Right. Um, and nowadays also with salaries, most salaried employees, I mean, they're working way longer than eight hours. Um, you know, I mean, the, you know, the eight hour workday in the nineties, they said for most people, it was a thing of the past. Um, you know, uh, you know, and the productivity of human labor is constantly going up because of technological advancement. Uh, but yet, you know, the wages that we get, um, in terms of inflation tend to go down, um, and struggles like that are very, very important. Um, so that's a very important anniversary. The stone masons, those are bricklayers, right? Um, you know, you know, when people say masons, there's probably things someone thinking the Illuminati did it, and it's not, not the Illuminati, right? It's not some secret society. It's guys whose job it is to lay stone and brick, right? They're masons, they're bricklayers. So there we go. All right. Hello, my name is Chamonic. Why is Miami worm capital? Is Miami worm capital? Do they have a lot of worms in Miami? Um, I, 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 I mean, I don't know. I, I've been to Miami before. I didn't notice a lot of worms. Are you referring to the gusanos? That's generally what they refer to the Cuban exile community as, right? It's because they, they just got on a boat. Miami is very close to, you know, to, you know, it's about 90 miles from, yeah. Okay. See, Gavin, Gavin picked up on it. Okay. So that's an innuendo. She's referring to that. Well, it's because it's close, right? That's where the Cuban exiles after the Cuban revolution, they went. Thank you, Gavin, for being a savior there. Uh, that's where they went. Uh, you know, they, they went to, uh, went to Miami, right? Um, Miami politics and Republican politics are very much defi defined by the anti-Castro lobby, the Cuban exile community. Um, and then the Cuban exile community is very close to the Venezuelan exile community, the, you know, the Nicaraguans, et cetera. It tends to be a magnet for the various, um, because it was the Cuban exiles where they set up, it tends to be people who flee from various Latin American socialist and anti-imperialist revolutions. They tend to stay there. And they're very closely tied in with Israel. Uh, the, the Cuba lobby, you know, the Gusano lobby uh, and the anti uh anti-Iran lobby and the pro-Palestine lobby are very close. That's interesting. Um, so there you go. There you go. Um, all right. China's UN ambassador gave a great speech denouncing the UN veto of Palestine membership. Well, John gave us a link and John is a beloved member of our community. I was going to show John's speech on Yuhuru again. Um, uh, but maybe I'll do that on tomorrow night's stream. Uh, so I guess maybe we'll just watch this uh, this this video, right? I I'm all for that. So John, I think we will we will watch uh, your uh, we will watch the uh, the speech that was given by the um, the Chinese ambassador to the UN, right? Uh, so if I can just pull up the link here. We'll we'll put that on. Thank you, thank you for this. Thank you for the su suggestion. Thank you for the suggestion, John. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Let me just pl plug that into my technology and we'll, we'll put that on. That'll be good. All right. And while we're waiting for that to download. Um, all right. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Much appreciated, John. I'm glad, I'm glad you like what we're doing here. 
Uh, and same to Iranian Putin. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you. I mean, a lot of people just like what we're doing here. And I, I like you back, you know. Um, you all are great. And uh, yeah, I'm glad that I'm I'm putting on a good show for you all. You know, the focus is anti-imperialism. That's what we're all about here. All right. So now we have the video of the China UN ambassador speech. Um, so let's put it on. Let's put it on. Right. United States. Okay, so we're gonna skip that and we're just gonna start the speech. All righty. Today is a sad day. Because of the veto by the United States, the application by Palestine for full membership at the UN has been rejected. The decade-long dream of the Palestinian people ruthlessly dashed. China finds the decision by the US most disappointing. An independent state of Palestine has been a long-cherished intergenerational dream of the Palestinian people. Its full membership at the UN is a crucial step in that historical direction and process. As early as 2011, Palestine submitted an application. Because of some countries' opposition, the Council's action at that time was put on hold. Thirteen years are long enough. And yet, we still hear some complaints asserting that there isn't enough time and there's no need to rush into actions. These claims are disingenuous. The admission of Palestine as a full member of the UN is more urgent now than ever before. The relevant countries premised its inability to support Palestine in UN member, in, in, uh, of UN's membership is on the grounds that the state of Palestine does not have the capacity to govern. We do not agree with this assessment. Over the past 13 years, the situation in Palestine has changed in many ways, the most fundamental of which has been the expansion of settlements in the West Bank. Palestine's viable space as a state has been steadily squeezed. The foundation of the two-state solution has been continuously eroded. The relevant countries have ignored this and adopted an attitude of acquiescence or even connivance. And now they turn around at this time and question Palestine's capacity to govern. This is gangster logic that confuses right and wrong. What is even more unacceptable is some countries challenging Palestine's eligibility for membership of the UN under the UN Charter implying that it, is still remains, it still remains a question whether Palestine is peace-loving. Such an allegation is outrageous and a step too far. For the Palestinian people who are suffering under occupation, this is tantamount to rubbing salt in their wounds and extremely insulting. If it is out of political calculation to oppose Palestine's full membership at the UN, it would be better to simply say so, instead of making excuses to re-victimize the Palestinian people. President, the establishment of an independent state is an inalienable national right for the Palestinian people. This cannot be subject to any questioning or bargaining. The relevant countries make direct negotiations between Palestine and Israel a prerequisite, claiming that Palestine's membership at the UN can only be the result of negotiations. This is putting the cart before the horse. There is clear clarity of Israel's rejection of the two-state solution. Against this backdrop, the admission of the State of Palestine at the UN as a full member would allow Palestine to enjoy equal status with Israel and would help to create conditions for the resumption of negotiations between the two sides. All countries that genuinely support the two-state solution should not stand in the way of Palestine's full membership at the UN. President, the wheel of history is rolling forward. The trend of the time is irresistible. We are convinced that the day will come when the state of Palestine will enjoy the same rights as other members of the United Nations, that Palestine and Israel as two states will be, living, will be able to live side by side in peace as neighbors with the two peoples, Palestinian and Israelis, living in tranquility and happiness. China will continue to make unremitting efforts and play a constructive role for the early realization of that day. And thank you, President. Bravo! What a good speech. All right. 
I thought she would hate it, but there you go. I'm just kidding. Of course, just kidding. All right. Well, that was a very good speech. So, all right. So Ukraine gives the Bidens 10 million and Dementia Joe uses the FBI and the NSA to blackmail all opposition to give 200 billion to the Ukraine money laundering scheme. So there's no path to victory. Well, yeah, people are asking about how much um, of a, you know, um, what do you might call like a, a loop or whatever is going on because, you know, Burisma Holdings, uh, because of that, you know, that, that, that crypto guy, what was his name? The crypto guy that, that was involved in Ukraine and that whole thing. And, you know, there's a lot of individual people padding their pockets. This isn't simply the overall interest of imperialism. There is a lot of corruption like just straight corruption and money laundering and, you know, back peddling, back channeling, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, going on. Uh, there's no question about that. I mean, and there's been a lot on that. So great video, Caleb. Dig the African People's Socialist Party, Uhuru. Well, everything must be done to support them. And I'm actually going to show our, our member, uh, John McCarthy. Um, you know, he did a great presentation, a great speech at our convention that we did in December. He gave a great speech, um, you know, about uh, why, why we need to stand with the Uhuru case and why they are so important. So I'm going to put that speech on because it really just explains the, the case in very good detail. And it shows you, I mean, this was a speech at the CPI National Convention. Let's go. So our next guest, uh, He's going to talk about uh, something that also has to do with free speech quite a bit, uh, the Uhuru case. Uh, as we all know, the Uhuru were unlawfully prosecuted for basically being anti-imperialist. And uh, you all know our next guest, gentleman from Chicago. From Chicago! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The African People Socialist Party issued a new book, uh, except it's not really a new book. They reissued it. This is the testimony from the first World Tribunal on reparations for African people in America. And um, this took place in 1982. And there are a lot of very convincing arguments in here, documents and testimony, uh, about how the United States government is committing genocide and uh, about how reparations are deserved. Right? But it doesn't matter whether these arguments convince you or not. What matters is that uh, the Chairman O'Malley Yeshitala and the African People's Socialist Party are convinced. And since 1982, the chairman has been traveling all over the United States and all over the world making this case to anyone who will listen, not even to people who would rather not listen. Right? <laughs> but uh, Joe Biden has some uh, very smart uh, detectives working for him, and he figured out that all of this is actually a uh, big Russian conspiracy <laughs> to sow dissent in the United States. And uh, the ringleader, they found out, is this gentleman here, Alexander Ionov. And uh, his birthday is actually in a few days. He was born December 12th. Uh, December 12th, 1989. <laughs> now, if you're like me, you spend way too much time on social media. <laughs> and you probably run into a lot of these vote blue, no matter who people. Yeah. And they have a new slogan. Their slogan is, uh, Joe Biden deserves more credit 
<laughs> he's not getting the credit that he deserves. He's not. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I hate to admit this because they're really annoying. <laughs> but they actually have a point. You meant to time travel. Because, right, oh, you're still in there. <laughs> because, yes, China, they have trains that go faster than airplanes. And Russia, they've developed missiles that can change direction at hypersonic speeds. But Joe Biden, yes, Joe Biden, he has discovered time travel. <laughs> Now, obviously, they don't, they don't believe this nonsense, right? They're not worried about uh, who told Chairman Yesitel to say this. They're worried about what he's saying. And uh, the specific thing that they mentioned in these indictments is that the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Movement wrote articles and uh, released videos where they said that uh, the special military operation in Ukraine is actually a defensive action by Russia right. Right, against colonialism and that by standing up and fighting back Russia is defending not just itself but the entire global south. Now, they want to make it illegal to say that. That's what this case is all about. That, that's yeah. why it's so urgent, because guess what? That's the message that we're putting out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And uh, it's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. uh, because Russia is winning that war politically, economically, and militarily, that is giving courage to anti-imperialist nations and movements all around the world to finally stand up. What we see happening right now in Palestine is occurring because they saw Russia winning and they saw that the imperialists can no longer back up their threats. Mm -hmm. And we have to give that message to, to the American people. They don't know it because just like it's giving courage to nations around the world, if the American people know it, it's going to give them courage to stand up yeah. and grow, grow off imperialism. So I'm, I'm not going to talk long. I just wanted to say that I feel very grateful for the role that I have been able to play in creating solidarity between the Uhuru movement and the Center for Political Innovation. Because in my 50 something years on this earth, I've been a part of a lot of different campaigns and movements and organizations. And they're all a little bit different, but there's some constants. And one constant that has remained is I hate the FBI. <laughs> we're, not supposed to, we're not supposed to have a political police in this country, but that's what they are. Yeah. And I don't like what they did to Marcus Garvey. Uh, I don't like what they did to the Nation of Islam. I don't like what they did to Paul Robeson. I don't like what they did to the Christic Institute, to the LaRouche movement, or to the Teamsters. Mm -hmm. I don't like what they did to Rod Blagojevich <laughs> and to Chicago Alderman. I don't like what they've done to people who I don't even like. Yes. Yeah. But I hate what they tried to do to Caleb and to the Center for Political Innovation and I hate what they're trying to do to Chairman O'Malley Yeshitala, the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Movement. And if I can create a collaboration between these two organizations and thereby strengthen each of them a little bit so that they have the strength not only to survive the FBI attacks, but to judo them into victory. Yeah. yeah. Then that is like a double fuck you <laughs> to the FBI. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's more of a fuck you squared. <laughs> and I'm enjoying every minute of it. So I'm working to victory to a world with
without colonialism and without imperialism and without the FBI. <laughs> All right. Well, that was great. That was absolutely tremendous. And if you'd like to join the Center for Political Innovation and become part of our our movement to build solidarity against imperialism, it's simply a matter of filling out a form on a website, 10 bucks a month, and then we have Zoom calls every Saturday. Uh, join the CPI and come to our workshop coming up next weekend. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we are very dedicated to building a new world beyond imperialism and building a community of solidarity. All right. Only 8% of Ukrainians said that they, they would be willing to fight on the front lines against Russia. Yeah, but they're drafting them like crazy. I mean, the mobilization law that Zelensky has just implemented, I mean, they're just dragging every Ukrainian off the street. Like what Marjorie Taylor Greene said in her speech about how the, the whole country, I mean, they're not going to have any young men left, uh, you know, to work in their industries. They're going to just completely wipe out the next generation of Ukrainians. I mean, it is unbelievable, uh, you know, and then they claim they care about Ukraine while they do this. I mean, Ukraine is going to come out of this uh, with, you know, I mean, their crops aren't going to grow. I mean, they're, you know, the bullets, the depleted uranium is going to just completely destroy their ability to grow crops. Um, I mean, it's, Ukraine is going to come out of this war completely fucked. Uh, and it won't be Russia's fault because Russia tried not to do this. And the United States provoked a situation where they could use Ukraines as cannon fodder to hurt Russia. Um, so there you go. I mean, it's not because they care about Ukrainians. Don't believe for a minute that they care about Ukrainians. They made this happen. Russia did everything they could to avoid this. Hey, Caleb, can you tell us about Stalin? My instinct is that he's a bad guy. Perhaps I've been psyoped. Well, I mean, let's just step back for a minute, okay? Before Stalin, uh, Russia didn't have full electrification. Uh, most of the country didn't have running water and electricity. It was Stalin that led the industrialization of the country. It was Stalin that led Russia to become the first country in outer space, the Soviet Union. It was Stalin who mobilized the world to defeat the Nazis. Uh, it was Stalin who was the leader of the global communist movement at the time that it won great victories. It's because of Stalin and his leadership of a global mass movement and the class struggle movement in the United States, that the civil rights movement broke out in the United States in the 1950s because the Soviet Union was doing everything it could to highlight the issue of Jim Crow segregation. Uh, it's because of Stalin uh, that, um, that we have eight hour work days and social security and unemployment insurance. I gave a speech recently uh, to the U.S. friends of the Soviet people. It's on this YouTube channel. You can go and listen to it. And I, I used that speech to talk about the impact Stalin has had on world history. Um, and honestly, it's one of the better talks I gave. I'm really lucky I recorded it with my phone because the, you know, the video or whatever wasn't working and, and all that, but I recorded it with my phone and I, I gave a very, very good presentation to the U S friends, the Soviet people about why Stalin should be supported. Why, I mean, why Stalin played a great, great role in history. Um, you know, that's not politically correct to say we're supposed to, you know, it's one thing that everybody knows, you know, I always tell people. If somebody comes at you and says, hey, Stalin killed 100 gajillion billion people. He killed 100 million, 200 million, 300 million. Say, how? How? How did he kill these people? That's the first question you should ask, just how? Right? Um, and then from there, people will give you, um, they will say, well, there was a famine. And it's like, wait a second. Before Stalin showed up, there were famines all the time in Russia. There was deaths related to malnutrition in Russia all the time before Stalin showed up. And Stalin's the guy who cured the famines. Stalin's the guy who built a modern farming system. Stalin's the guy who brought tractors to the countryside. Stalin's the guy who industrialized. So how is Stalin responsible for killing all these people when he cured the famines? That'd be like saying that the doctor who cures the cancer is responsible for the cancer. I mean, so those big numbers that you get, those hundreds of millions, of, I mean... Again, Stalin cured the famines. So that argument is bunk. 
And they say, well, there's gulags. Well, there's more people in American prisons now than there are in, were in Soviet gulags. There were hundreds of thousands of people in gulags. That's bad. It's wrong. It's not huge millions like those numbers you're giving. There were hundreds of thousands of people that were in gulags. But most people survived. The gulags were not death camps. Um, many people went to the gulag for a year or two, and then they left. And yes, everyone admits that a lot of people who shouldn't have been in those gulags were there. Right. And eventually Yezhov, the leader of the secret police, was executed for his role in fomenting a situation where a lot of people were wrongfully sent to gulags in the great terror of 1936 and 1937. Um, you know, and I think we can we can acknowledge that, you know, the gulag system was horrible and that a lot of people ended up there who shouldn't have been there. And there was a period of great panic in the late 1930s about Nazi spies and all of that. But to be fair, I mean, there was, when the Nazis invaded, there was a top general who did defect and go over to them. And the idea that there was some kind of Nazi conspiracy, um, you know, some kind of Nazi conspiracy in the USSR, it was very real, right? There were top Soviet generals who defected as soon as the war started. Um, so the idea that there was a, you know, a Nazi conspiracy inside the Soviet government, I think that that's pretty well confirmed by history. There was one. Um, it's also very clear that a lot of very innocent people got accused falsely, ended up in prison, and we don't support that, right? Um, but, you know, that's not the equivalent of what the Nazis did. The Nazis had gas chambers. The Nazis rounded up a bunch of people on the basis of their race and took them someplace and killed them for their race. And the Nazis, you know, that's not what anyone accuses Stalin of doing, right? So the famine thing is bunk. The gulag thing is not what they say it is. It was awful, but it's not any, it's not those huge numbers you hear. Then there's this thing about forced deportations, right? And they say, well, he engaged in ethnic cleansing, forced deportations. You do realize that 27 million Soviet people died in the Second World War. And during the war, when they were fighting off foreign invaders in a war where 27 million people gave their lives, um, they did move people around on the basis of their nationality. And a lot of Jews were moved around on the basis of their nationality, and that prevented them from being executed. When the Nazis would take a city, uh, they would just line up all the Jews and shoot them. Um, you know, I think there's a very famous psychoanalyst, Sabina Spielrein, a very famous associate of Sigmund Freud, and she was living in Russia. The Nazis took over the city she was in, and so they, they took all the local Jews to a synagogue and lined them all up and shot them. She was shot, shot dead, right? But Millions of Soviet Jews were saved because of a policy they had of moving people around on the basis of their nationality. Chechens, there was a pro-Nazi Chechen insurgency. So they moved all the Chechens out of Chechnya in order to defeat the insurgency. Now, that wasn't pleasant. I'm sure it was an awful thing, but it's also pretty unpleasant that 27 million people died in a war. I mean, it's not, you think about the context, right? It's not like Stalin, everything was just peaceful and calm. And Stalin just said, you know, I want to move one race. I want to remove one ethnic group to another place. That's not what happened, right? And so if you look at the, the forced deportation, it's like you're dealing with the context of a huge, brutal war, um, you know, and during that war, they did move people in the country around on the basis of their nationality. That's not ethnic cleansing. That's not genocide. That's, that's the kind of awful thing that one has to do during a war. Um, so... I mean, those are the three big, those big numbers tend to come from those three allegations, right? The famines, well, Stalin cured the famines. The gulags, gulags were awful, but they weren't death camps. And, you know, a lot of innocent people ended up there and Stalin eventually executed the guy who was blamed for the great terror. And it was a bad period, but, you know, it's not, it's not those big numbers. And then you have the, what do you call it? The, the forced deportations, ethnic cleansing, again, in the context of a war, moving people around. So, when people give you those numbers about Stalin killed a hundred million people, that's, that's bunk, you know, um, Stalin carried out many great achievements for humanity. Um, was the USSR a very authoritarian place? Absolutely. Uh, did the USSR have the kind of freedoms that we have here in America at this time? No, no, it did not because they were, you know, rising up from nothing. They were surrounded, they were blockaded, you know, um, is it possible Stalin, you know, made bad decisions? Is it possible that Stalin harmed? I mean, there's no way that Stalin couldn't make decisions that would harm people, right? Under the, un, in the position that Stalin was in, uh, you know, I mean, he was deciding, 
you know, when there's, you know, when there's a, a food shortage, he's deciding who gets food and who doesn't. So some people are going to not be happy with that. There's no way Stalin could be Stalin and not hurt a lot of people. There's no way Stalin could be Stalin and not, you know, not make decisions that many people would consider to be horrific or tyrannical. Um, but that said, I don't, I don't find the portrait of Stalin in Western media to be accurate. And I, I think that in terms of advancing humanity, uh, Stalin achieved a huge amount. Uh, so he started the process. I um, mean, he turned Russia into an industrial superpower. He started the process that led to the Chinese Revolution and China becoming a superpower. He was an ally of the labor movement in the United States. He was an ally of the Black freedom struggle. You look at the United Nations. I mean, you could say Stalin built that, right? I mean, if it hadn't been, uh, well, you know, you want to see a Stalin interview, go read his interview with H.G. Wells. A very, very good interview that Stalin did with H.G. Wells called, um, it's generally titled Marxism versus Liberalism. And it's Stalin's chat with H.G. Wells. Um, it's very good. Uh, it's actually one of the one of the best interviews uh, I've ever read uh, where Stalin, you know, it was spoken. It's a transcript where H.G. Wells and Stalin, you know, um, sat down um, and it's really good. Um you know, it's really one of the uh, one of the best uh, Marxist pieces out there. Go and read Stalin's interview with H.G. Wells. Um, I think that's a great place to start. All right. How would you respond to the opinion that populism is inherently anti-Semitic and homophobic? Well, my first question is, why would you say that? Do you think that all people deep down hate Jews and hate gay people? I don't. I mean, I mean, is there resentment toward Jews in different countries and such? Sure. Is there anti-gay sentiment in a lot of countries? Sure. But I don't think deep down most people are hateful, right? I think that bigotry is something reinforced by the system that we live under. Um, and that as we become a more global society, as we become more integrated, people are moving away from that kind of thing. I don't think people deep down are anti-gay or, or anti-Jewish. Um, you know, uh, I think the essence of populism is wanting to make a better life for people overall, right? It's, it's championing the majority. Communism is very populist, right? Uh, the Communist Manifesto says all previous movements have been movements for minorities. But our movement is the movement on behalf of the immense majority. And that's what populism means. Populism just kind of means a movement trying to champion making life better for the majority. The idea that populism is inherently racist or backward, I mean, that's that's something that's really been inculcated in us by, by American media, but it's not accurate. I actually wrote a very good piece on populism, um, you know, that was published by Mint Press a few years back when Donald Trump got elected. Uh, shortly afterwards, I wrote a book, a piece on the history of populism. Um, and I talked about the populist movement and I talked about how right wing populism was kind of manufactured. It was one of my better pieces. Uh, and I would encourage you to go read that because, you know, this idea that populism is always the Ku Klux Klan or populism is always lynch mobs or something. That is that is a new left lie. Anti-populism is a very, very big part of the new left. Um, and it's their anti-humanitarian sentiment. So there you go. Did you see Pepe Escobar's tweet on the alleged Israeli attempt to detonate a nuclear bomb over Iran to deliver an EMP shut down their electric grid? I did not see that. That sounds terrifying, Mariah. I feel like I should see that. Um, wow, that's intense. Um, I, I mean, I know that there's been talk of nuking Iran for some time. Seymour Hirsch has revealed some of the Pentagon discussion. You know, Seymour Hirsch has intelligence connections that leak important material to him. And he, he often reveals things that are going on inside the CIA, but that's wow. Yeah, that's, that's intense. Do you really think that Russell Bentley is dead? Is there a chance he's still alive? Well, the fact that I, you know, the, the news agencies that were not saying that at first Sputnik RT, um, the fact that they're saying it now uh, makes me seem to think that that is the case. Uh, before when Ukrainian media was saying it, but other media was not saying it, um, you know, I, I held off, but now at this point, his wife has confirmed it. He is, he is dead. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very sad. It's very, very, very sad. 
you know, I wish I could tell you otherwise. Um, but the fact that his wife has confirmed it, the fact that, that Sputnik and RT and the Russian media is overall saying that that is the case, I, you know, it looks like it's reality. If Mexico invited Russia and China to build military bases on their nor northern border, the United States would do exactly what Russia has done. Exactly they would. You bet they would. In a heartbeat, they would. And and I don't understand why people can't get that basic reality, but it's because no one says it to them, right? They're, they just never allow common sense to prevail when it comes to this foreign policy. We have, you know, we they've given people, kind of like what this guy said about, oh, I, I, I feel like Stalin's a bad guy. Well, you're, you're primed to think that. So anything you hear about Stalin, you're going to interpret it in the most you know, negative light. Right. And this is how this is how mainstream media tends to operate. Right. It, it gives a bias. And then you assume. Right. And so they, they accuse, you know, Putin or Russia of something. And then you say, well, is that true? And they say, oh, are you defending Russia? Well, maybe I'm just trying to find out what's true. But that's apparently not allowed in American media at this time. So, yeah, I mean, there you go. There you go, folks. But all right. Well, I will be back tomorrow, most likely. Um, but, um, you know, uh, the center for political innovation is marching ahead, uh, join the center for political innovation. We need more members. Uh, we need more people building up a community of solidarity. If you want to donate to our upcoming retreat, um, you know, here's, I'll put the donate, um, link, you know, you know, donate to CPI, uh, to help us, uh, with our upcoming gathering, um, you know, that, that we're planning, uh, that. It's happening next weekend. There's still more room if you want to register and come. We'd love to have you. Uh, but if you want to donate to help us do our, our educational workshop next weekend, that would be great. Help us deal with some last minute expenses. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to put on the closing music and I'll be back. I'll be back pretty soon. I'll be back. All right. New upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. While the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today.